Good evening. Welcome to our Monday Thursday worship service. Welcome also to those of you joining us online via Facebook or listening to this later on our podcast or call in number. Um, tonight we are entering the Andish of Holy Week. Um, don't forget tomorrow there is a seven o'clock community Good Friday service at Lincoln Community UMC just yeah, that way. Um, or if you need something earlier, Macon will be having a five o'clock uh, Good Friday service as well. So, um, and then I think there's some stuff happening Sunday, something. Yeah, um, but you'll have to come and find out. So, do we have anything else we need to go over before we get started? All right. If you would please open your bulletins and join me in our greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. On this night of all nights, our Lenten journey has brought us here. We lift up the cup of salvation. Throughout the generations, to others what the Lord has given to us, the cup of the new covenant, he gives us an example and a commandment ever new, this is how everyone will know we are his disciples. If you would open your hymnal to number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This, and join as you wish and are able.
You may be seated. My fellow siblings of Jesus, Christ shows us his love by becoming a humble servant. Let us draw near to God and confess our sin in the truth of God's spirit. Please use the following brief period of silence for individual confession between yourself and God. Please join me in our collected prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we, your church, confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ, where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him, Forgive us, we pray, and by your Spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, but Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead and ascended on high for us, and continues to intercede for us. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. If you would please join me in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that we may see the light of your word in the darkness of our lives. And seeing, we will understand. Understanding, may we do all that you ask. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first scripture reading for this evening can be found on page 65 in the Bibles in the pews. We are in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 14. This section of text carries the header, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
If you would rise as you are able and join in hymn number 618, let us break bread together. Uh, Verses 1 through 3. Please be seated. Our second reading for tonight can be found beginning on page 1066. We are in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 17, then continuing at verse 31b, or the second half of verse 31, through verse 35. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world pardon me, to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. God. If you'd please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. Almighty, all merciful God, through Christ Jesus, you have taught us to love one another, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and even to love our enemies. In times of violence and fear, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts so that we may not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Help us to see each person in the light of the love and grace you have shown us in Christ. Put away the nightmares of terror and awaken us to the dawning of your new creation. Establish among us a future where peace reigns, justice is done with mercy, and all are reconciled. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Commandments. There's a whole bunch of those in the Bible, right? I mean, there's at least 10 that we know of, for sure. 10 commandments that Moses brought down to the Israelites from God. But are there more? What about the two new commandments that Jesus gives in the New Testament, the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. So just those 12 then, right? Eh, Not exactly. So just how many are there? Well, I was curious, and so I did some research, and from what I have found, there are just a few more than 12. According to biblical scholars, there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament alone. These are typically referred to as the Law of Moses, or just the Law. 613. That's a lot of commandments. Okay, well, what about the New Testament? There's got to be fewer there, right? I mean, Jesus focused on those two new ones, but the rest of the New Testament is about spreading the gospel, right? (laughs) Yeah, think again. I went back to my research and found that scholars identify quite a few more than just those two from Jesus when he's interacting with the lawyer or religious scholar of his time. How does 1,050 sound? 1,050. There are some potential repetitions in that list but not enough to get that number below 1,000, most likely. So if we add them all up, we are looking at over 1,600 commandments across the two testaments of Scripture. 1,600 commandments. Anybody else want to just go back to that first 10 and then the the two that Jesus highlighted? I, I, I could not remember 1,600 commandments if my life depended on it. Thankfully, it doesn't. I don't know that I could remember six outside of the ten and those other two. So why all this talk of commandments? Isn't the primary focus of our passage for tonight about washing people's feet? Well, as I've said before, There are countless different themes that can be found within the same scripture passage over time, depending on who's looking at them and what God's trying to communicate. And our gospel reading for this evening is no exception to that reality. For example, tonight I could have focused on the act of foot foot washing by Jesus and, and the challenge he gives his disciples to follow his example towards others. Another option could have been to look at Peter's refusal at first to let Jesus wash his feet and Jesus' response to him saying, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Then there's also the theme of looking at who was at the table with Jesus that night and his response to them. There was Judas who he knows will betray him, at least according to our gospel writer. Then there was Peter, who will deny Jesus. 
Then there are James and John who will be unable to keep watch and pray with Jesus in the garden. They will be the two of the ones who keep falling asleep. And then the others who will ultimately forsake Jesus in his darkest hour of need. This group that has, I hate to say it this way, but really disappointed Jesus time and time again does not get scolded or chastised or, or punished. But instead, Jesus gently washes the ugliness of each one. And those are just three potential themes and focuses that could be used for our scripture reading. But tonight, tonight I want to instead focus on commandments, or rather one specifically. If we look back to verse 34 and 35, Jesus says to his disciples, I give you a new commandment. Love each other Just as I have loved you, so you must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Love each other. Doesn't sound so hard, right? Pretty simple and straightforward. No, maybe, maybe not. If we stop for a minute and and think about what is going on here, we realize that Jesus is spending his last meal with, with his friends, and he is pleading with them to love each other despite their own difference and disagreements. And believe me, they had a lot of disagreements between the disciples. Some of it is recorded in Scripture, but it's a fair guess that there was a lot more than what we have written evidence of. And this is really compelling What if we looked at this act of Jesus washing his disciples' feet? What might it look like in this this lens? Not just in relationship to the world around us, but also in relationship to those people, the people in the church, maybe even sitting right next to one of us right now, maybe someone who's hurt us. Or how about in relationship to those that we love? If we can do that, this commandment of loving one another can take us so close to the very heart of the gospel tonight. You see, we we have to remember that the disciples were not a group of best friends hanging out all the time. They didn't always get along. They definitely did not always treat each other the way that Jesus would have wanted them to. In Matthew chapter 20, we read about James and John wanting to sit on the right and left-hand sides of Jesus and his kingdom, coming at a mother's request, obviously seeing themselves, or she at least seeing her sons, as above the others. Or what about in Luke chapter 9, when the disciples are arguing over who among them is the greatest? And that argument comes up again in Luke chapter 22. And I'll be honest, every time I end up at one of those arguments about who is the greatest, I, I tend to picture a bunch of drunken frat guys arguing about, you know, who is the greatest. These are a group of... Oh, sorry. So there was a group of buddies who went out on the weekends to go fishing. Well, they did go fishing a lot together, but not in the way we might go out with some of our friends. Now, these were people that came from different social standings. Some were siblings, but these were only normal, everyday people at heart. They didn't always get along. Sound familiar at all? How many people here have ever gotten into an argument with a brother or a sister? You don't have to raise your hands. Maybe someone here has gotten into a disagreement with a coworker or a neighbor. There's probably someone here who has had a struggle with another member of the church, whether the church or the greater church. Don't forget, I remember, I know who serves on which committees. In all seriousness, though, I don't think Christians are all that different than the disciples that follow Jesus. We don't always really understand what Jesus has been trying to tell us. 
We sometimes lose focus on what is most important that Jesus is trying to teach us or show us. We sometimes worry about who is the greatest. But there's another way, the most important way, that we are like the disciples who followed Jesus throughout his ministry. And that way is that despite our, our failings, despite our confusions, despite our human nature, Jesus still loves us. And Jesus still made the sacrifice of his life to save us. Yes, we were not all there that night when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, so Jesus did not, in a literal fashion, wash our feet. But we have been washed by Jesus. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb that has made us clean, clean from our sins and and clothed in the everlasting love and grace of Jesus Christ. But, just like the disciples were given this commandment to love each other, we too have been challenged by Jesus when he said, just as I have loved you, so you must also love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Jesus was telling his disciples and is telling us when we read those words that that how we act towards each other is how others will see Jesus in us. When we treat each other in this room, other Christians, with love, others will know that we are followers of Christ. But there's more. Because it's not just about how we love other Christians or other members of our churches, it's, it's also about how we treat those who are not members of our churches and also those who are not Christians. When we treat them with that same love that Jesus has shown to us, then we are taking this commandment to the next level. Yes, we must always treat other Christians with love as an example to the world and to show the love of Jesus in ourselves. We can't forget that part. But when we also show that same love of Jesus, that love that he has shown us to the entire world, that's when the love of Jesus and God shine even brighter, can light up even the darkest corners of the world and even the darkest corners of the hearts of humanity. That is when love continues to claim victory in a world that has been attacked by sin. That is when peace will have a real, and I mean real, chance to flourish and abound on this globe. But before we can do that effectively and in long-lasting, meaningful ways, we must first Love each other like Jesus loves us. We must first come together as siblings in Christ and love each other following the example of Jesus throughout Scripture. Yeah, siblings will bicker and fight. It's normal. It's human. It's okay. But it's only okay if we're still loving each other like Jesus. That means forgiving each other. That means still loving each other, even when we are pushed to what we think might be our limit. It means not being vengeful towards each other. And that means letting love, God's love, guide us in our relationships with one another. Because that's what Jesus has commanded us to do. Love each other as Jesus has loved us. Forgiveness, sacrifice, care. Now, I want you to take a second here and think about the last time that you told someone that you loved them. Now, I'm guessing it was said to maybe your spouse or a child or some other member of your family. You may have even said it to a close friend. But I wonder, when was the last time you said it, if ever, to someone in the church who was not related to you? 
and saying it's, like I said, not related to you. So spouse, child, that doesn't count. Someone in the church who is not part of your DNA. So here's what I want us to do tonight. This is a night that is all about love, specifically Jesus' love for his disciples and really for all of humanity. In a moment here when I tell you, I want you to turn to someone sitting near you, groups two or three, whatever works, and I want you to say to each other, I love you as a sibling in Christ Jesus, as Christ loves me. Make sense? Everybody got it? Okay, one more time. You're going to turn to someone near you and say, I love you as a sibling in Christ Jesus, just as Christ loves me. Okay, on the count of three, we're going to do this. One, two, three. Awesome. I even saw some hugs. Makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And I want to tell each and every one of you that I love you as a beloved child of God in Jesus, just as Christ loves me. Now, now we need to go and live into those words. We need to take that seriously and really make the fullest effort that we can. And we must start with how we love each other and then move on to how we love those who are not in this space with us, in our faith community. How we love the people who do not identify as Christians, those who have not yet come to know the love of Jesus and of God, that's the next step. When we can do those two things, loving each other and extending that each other part to the entire world. We do them fully and truthfully as a part of who we are. That's when we are then fulfilling the commandment that Jesus has given the disciples that night and given to us. Love each other just as I have loved you, so you must also love each other, must love each other, not well, if you get around to it and it's not too much trouble, love each other. No, must love each other. At the end of our service, when you, when you leave here this evening, go and serve God by following this commandment to love each other. Let the world know that you are a disciple of Christ. Amen. If you would please join me in an attitude of prayer. God of power and might, on the night of Passover, you commanded your people to be ready to go in a hurry, to be dressed with sandals on their feet and walking stick in hand as they ate a special meal. We pray for people everywhere who long for freedom, who are ready, eager to do as you have commanded. Bring down oppression's rule, overturn unjust laws, Break the chains of those still enslaved. Banish every form of human trafficking. Compel us without delay to enter a new place where all lives are honored and all voices are heard. God of tenderness and compassion on the night before he died, Jesus set a table for his disciples. They took off their sandals and sat down in the presence of their teacher and Lord who washed their feet one by one. We pray for people whose feet are tired and dusty from hard labor, for those whose backs are bent by care and worry, for those laid low by illness or guilt or grief. Wash away, we pray, the tiredness of our bodies and souls. Hold gently in your healing hands the broken places in our lives and relationships. Be our company in isolation our source of hope and despair, and the way forward at every dead end. 
God of all good gifts, thank you for setting a table of welcome for everyone, for making room, whether we are faithful or faithless or failures. We pray that all who are hungry may find enough to eat and have clean water to drink as we share and live more responsibly. Teach us to sit down with enemies sharing common meals and common hopes. Make us true servants of yours for the sake of the world. Teach us to love as you love for the sake of the world. We pray for faith that is worth handing on to yet another generation for the sake of this world that you love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The psalmist asks, what shall I return to the Lord for all of God's bounty to me? And then declares, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows and offer thanksgiving in the presence of the congregation. With gratitude for God's bounty to us, we join the psalmist praising God with our offerings. Please rise as you are able and join in our doxology number 95 in the Red Hymnal. We are your servants, O God, for you have loosed all other bonds that held us captive. In freedom we follow you, in gratitude we praise you. Celebrating all that you have done for us in Christ, we bring before you tithes and offerings, bread and wine, asking you to add your blessing so that all that we have and all that we may, excuse me, and all that we are may be used in blessing others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated and turn in your hymnals to pages 15 and 16 as we celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenants to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift. Emptying himself that our joy might be full, he fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread, juice, and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, and what that means is that this table doesn't belong to me, to this church, to our denomination. It belongs to Jesus Christ and he alone, and he's invited everyone to come and partake. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your ethnicity, your financial or social standing, your sexual orientation or identification, all those ways we try to divide ourselves from each other, those boxes that we keep cramming each other into, it's not what he sees. Jesus looks out from this table and sees siblings, beloved children of God. All that he asks when you come and partake is that you do so with an open heart. This evening as we celebrate this holy meal, you will come forward and be given a piece of bread and then can choose a cup of juice or wine. They will be clearly marked. You can then receive your elements one of two ways. You can do intinction, which is a big word that means you take your bread, you dip it in your juice or wine, and then receive the elements together. Or you can just eat the bread and then drink your juice or wine. It's just two of the things we have developed in the church over many, many centuries. Neither one is more correct than the other. But brothers and sisters, the table has been set. Come and taste that God is good.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able for our closing hymn, which can be found in the thin black hymnal in the pews, the faith we sing hymnal, number 2254, in remembrance of me. disciples of our sibling Jesus Christ and beloved children of the God of mercy and grace Jesus has set an example for us to serve others as he has served us and to love one another as he has loved us go and do likewise so that everyone can tell that we are his disciples and now may God who led Israel out of slavery into freedom may Christ who led us out of death into life and may the Holy Spirit who leads us out of fear into boldness abide with you this holy Thursday in the holy days ahead and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.